Hello, weaving friends. Well, I am nearing the end. I'm not at the end, but I'm nearing the end of this weave. You can see um, some of these cardboard um, pieces back there, and I can just feel when I'm warping it up, it's, it's, I'm losing lots of volume back there. So we're getting close to the end, and I want to talk about salvages for a minute. Now, I am no expert on salvages. I want to make that really clear. You can see on this one that um, my salvages have drawn in a little. They've evened out on both sides now. It's not like it was before. Um, this side is just about as much drawn in as the other. And that's fine. I don't really mind that. In fact, I kind of like that a little tight. Uh, it almost looks like a real selvage on fabric. Um, but I wanted to talk about when you weave, you get this advice that you're supposed to pinch the edge. Okay, and I'm going to try to get the camera on a stand somehow so I can weave while I do this. Let me see if I can manage that. Oh, looky who showed up underneath my weaving. Hello, Leo. Don't you dare jump up there. Oh, my goodness. I would be grumpy. Okay, we'll try this. No, no, no. Now, what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make here is they tell you to do it at a slant. And when you first start weaving, you're very careful and deciduous about doing everything they say. Oh, she's going, he's going after my yarn. Um, and you remember to do this on every single pass of the shuttle. And you pinch on the other end and uh, you pull this up. And this is very important. You can't just pinch. I personally think you really have to do this um, slanting of this yarn as it goes through. So let's look at this. Because you want for this yarn that's going through the shed to be absolutely loose. Okay? It should have no encumbrances. It should not be pinched in any of See how it's going up? It shouldn't be pinched in any of this. And this will get more problematic as you get further up. You'll have less space to make that slope, okay? If this yarn is pinched anywhere, like say say I forget to do it. Say I'm pinching it with my fingers on this side, but I forget to do much of a slope. I just have a little bit of slope here. If it's caught here, then it's not going to be free the yarn is not going to be free to pull all the way to the edge, which is what you want it to do when you beat. You want it to be loose. And I've even on this one, and I think it's really helped my selvage, I've tried to keep it loose, really loose uh, looking, so it's not, you know, not straight, kind of like that. And then beat it down. Because uh, then it's not pinched at any spot, and it will pull in, no, Leo, and the, the yarn will pull in toward this corner. This is the corner where it's attached, but you don't want it to, it's almost like the attached spot moves along here if, if this yarn is pinched um, in any way within this warp, okay? So at, if you're having trouble with your selvages and people say, oh, pinch the edge, pinch the edge, that only works if all the rest of this yarn is loose at every single pass. And if you forget for a few rows and your selvage starts to creep in, then it's really almost impossible to get it to go back out. It's very, very difficult. Um, so that's just my two cents worth. My opinion at this point is to make sure that you keep this slope steep enough so that you keep this yarn from being pinched in between any of these warp yarns in the shed. Okay, I'm done with the weave and it's time to do the hem stitch. Now, um, from watching Kelly Casanova's video, she ended here with a long tail, and so it was easy for her to make a little knot on the end. She also had a floating selvage. I'll put a link to her video up there. But I'm going to have to somehow make a little knot here to anchor this. And later on, I'll have to um, tie that, uh, weave that end in there. Okay. All right. So now I've just got a little knot there on the edge. Nothing huge. And I'm going to count three warp threads over. 
Uh, it's nice that my warp threads this time are lying nice and flat. Uh, when you first start, they're not quite doing that. Um, and then I'm going to go over three and under two and pull through. So what I've done, get some of these yarns out of the way. I've gone underneath three warp threads and then counted down two rows, two stitch rows into my, um, my weave. And I'll go ahead and pull that. And then I'm going to go back with my needle and go back under it again. But this time I don't go into the weave. I just pull straight across. Holding this end here. Because now, get that blue tail out of there. Now I've got a nice loop. And you stick your needle through there. It'll be nice when I've gone across some and don't have quite so much tail to work with. And then... You tie that, get that snug. All right, let's try that again. Again, this is my first time doing this. Is that three? Yes. One, two, three, one, two. Okay, I'm going to get my loop to this side so it's easy to see. Boy, that blue tail really wants to get in the way. Give it a nice tug snug. Here's my next three. Boom, boom. Go down two. Pull it through, go back around, go through the loop, and I know that there's various types of hem stitching. I think the important thing is to find something that is secure and looks good to you, and then just do it consistently, whatever stitch it is. But I appreciate somebody like Kelly Casanova who um, offers little tutorials online for people like me who need to get started. Just need somebody to get me get started. Okay, I'm sure these will look a little sloppy like my first ones on the other end did, but then as I get across, I'm sure they'll look tidier. I don't have time this afternoon to finish this because I am tired and it's late in the afternoon. But there is just the beginnings of my, of my end hem stitching at the end of my warp. I'll bring you back in later. I've now finished 
my hem stitch. I'm pretty pleased with it. I think it's more consistent than um, the one on the bottom edge that I did first. When I got to the end down here, I just I did the last four strands of yarn together and did it exactly as the others, even catching a little bit in here. And then when I was done, I um, used my needle to thread this tail through to here. Now, after I wet finish, some of these ends will go in a bit, so I'm leaving them. I want to look down here. This is characteristic of this entire weave, that when I change colors, I ended up with um, some weaving that looks like that, and that's particularly ugly. So what I want to do now that I've finished it is I want to go back and like I'm going to take this yellow one out. I'm going to take it all the way back to maybe here and then I'm going to reweave it with a needle into the same slot that um, that the yellow tracks up here and it'll look so much better than having it just cut off right here. Um, the blue doesn't look too bad because it's in a blue field right here uh, but the yellow looks pretty rough. Um, ones like this I'm just going to wet finish it, and then I'll I'll snip them pretty close. And there's a there's a nice overlap between these two, so I'm not going to end up with any big gaping holes. Um, yeah, again, this is the yellow is problematic because it stands out so much. So I'm going to um, try to tuck that back in and make it look a little bit more seamless. We'll see how that goes. I'm at the very end of the fringe knotting. I have decided to knot the individual clusters of three yarns in addition to doing the hem stitching just because I am going to wet finish it and I don't want anything to come undone. These knots are pretty small because the, these groups of yarns are very, it's not a big bunch. It's not like it's eight of them or something. It's just three um, and I don't want them to obscure that nice hem finish that I'm pretty pleased with. Um, and then after this, I'm going to cut the fringe off all the same length. The other thing I really want to have is something called a fringe twister. And I know you can make them yourself. I've I've watched people use them on YouTube. I've seen some that people make themselves. I know that you start with an alligator clip. For those of you who what, who don't know what this what I'm talking about, so what you do is you you have a a, a, a fringe twister. Well, that's hard to say. Has two alligator clips, and you clip this one on one and this clump on the other, and you twist 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 until um, they're pretty snug. And then you take them off and you knot the two together. And when you let go, they almost ply back on themselves in this beautiful um, little thing that looks better than this. <laughs> um, and then they're knotted and they stay and they look so pretty. And I really want to make myself a fringe twister. I have two little alligator clips that would be like for making little girl hair bows. I don't know that that's the kind that are needed. I think you have to get really nice ones at the hardware store. But I'll, um, and you have to do a little bit of woodworking and you have to have drills and washers and things like that. So it's going to require some pondering on my part and probably some help from my husband in order to do this. But I would really like, I'd love to twist the fringe on this. I'm leaving on a trip tomorrow to go see my mother. So I'm trying to finish this up um, as much as I can. I, I may get it wet finished tonight. I don't know. I've got to get this video ready, which means I can't finish the shawl. Because <laughs> um, I don't, I think I could get the fringe cut off and I could get it wet finished and dry it overnight, but I don't think I would be able to get all of the little ends that are in here um, sewn back into the, like all these little, little pieces like this, uh, back into the fabric of the weave. That's the thing that's going to take me an hour sitting on the couch to do and I just don't have that much time I've got to get got to get stuff done so it is what it is I'll be showing this to you when it's finished but it might be when I get back from my trip but I think you can see enough here what it looks like 
I'll have some pictures at the end. The plaid turned out, I think, very much what I wanted. There are some floats in here. I'm not really that bothered about that um, because the bulk of the weave is really, yeah, and it has a nice soft feel and a beautiful drape and weight to it. It's lightweight, but it does drape. It does not stiff. I'm quite, quite pleased. At first when I was working on it, I wondered if I was going to like it enough to keep it, but I think I do. I can't take it up to West Virginia, though, and show it to my mother because she'll ask to keep it in that wonderful way that elderly mothers do that you just can't turn down. <laughs> she'll say, oh, it feels so nice. Uh, no, I'm teasing. She's, she's lovely. She wouldn't do that. But um, I think I'll enjoy wearing it. This will be fun. Okay, I'm not going to yammer on anymore. I've got to, almost to the end, I'm going to sit down and edit, upload, export, all that stuff that you do. Oh, and thanks to all the new subscribers. I'm, tr I'm trying so hard to remember to say thank you for subscribing. Thank you for even looking at what I'm doing. I can't imagine it's of much interest to anybody. I don't have a life that's really any more interesting than anybody else's, and there are many people whose lives are much, much more exciting than mine, so why anybody would care to look at this YouTube channel, I'm not quite sure, but I'm very thankful that you do, thankful that you like it, um, and I'll take you along on my trip, although I know you've seen West Virginia several times now, maybe I'll find something new to show you. All right, the knots are done. We are off to trim. See you later. Well, you know your you know your hands are cold when you go collect eggs outside and it feels so good to hold two freshly laid eggs because they're still warm like the image of a chicken it's another beautiful day here on coastal North Carolina beautiful blue sky but I brought you out here. It's a little chilly, though. I brought you out here because I have some willow slips that I cut several months ago. Adam wanted me to cut these and put them in water before winter. So I had a big green bucket of water over here, and they sat and sat. I didn't know what he wanted them for. Um, I think he wanted to plant them somewhere. I'm not sure, but then he got too busy. And then a storm came along, and all of these little willow branches blew out of the bucket and lay there for a couple of cold weeks. And then I dumped the water out, and here they've been. And then I was walking by here a few days ago and noticed that one little branch here, which is no longer here, but one little branch had leaves on it. I was like, oh my goodness, one of those is alive after lying here all through December um, and January and February. So I told Adam, and he said, oh, that one might be good. Let's put it in the ground. So I did. But the rest of these, I don't know what to do with. So I think I'm going to just take them back to my burn barrel. Uh, I don't know. Where should I stick them in the ground somewhere? I don't know. But I'll show you what I did with the one with the leaves. Some of them have such bright green stems on the side. I feel like they must still be viable. And uh, what do they call it? Wick. So I think I'm going to take some of them and fill in some of the gaps in our willow circle here that we are slowly growing. But these are swamp willows, and these, this is from our one kind of specimen willow tree. So we'll see how that goes. Well, I'll put a few of those in the willow circle. Now we're walking past the big pine tree. Out into the pasture, and I don't think I ever really bring you guys out into the pasture. Um, I never go here myself. We did move the burn pile out here, as you see we do. But you see there's one little thing out there in the middle of the pasture. This is where Adam asked me to put the little willow sapling that had a green leaf. It would be lovely to have a great big willow tree here. I don't know how many years that'll take. I cut this off, I don't know, November. And just put it in the ground this morning. It's a good sized piece. 
I was actually pruning the willows because it was hard for him to mow underneath them. So I poured a lot of water in there, simply because we haven't had a lot of rain very recently. I wanted the ground to be moist. There's the little leaves. Put a stake there so Adam won't mow it over, but the stake is smaller than the tree is. I don't think he would mow that over unless he was going really fast. But this is, the top of the sapling is actually over my head. So you could say I'm, you know, relatively tall. He used to be 5'7". I don't know what I am now. So it's over 5 feet tall. Let's go look at the mother tree. So there she is, that first one there. And I think she's been in the ground for about five years. I have no idea how high up that goes. That's got to be 20 feet at least. Well, more like 25 to the tips. So hopefully in another five years, that little baby out there will be at least as big. That'll be nice. Somebody down the road 30 years from now, hopefully will enjoy a really big willow tree. Hey, it's me again, outside in beautiful weather. Very, very pretty weather today. It was cold last night and the night before, but it's warming up very nicely. This is, no, tomorrow's the warm day this week, but this is pretty good, 60, some 60. Anyway, I was gonna do more of that metal. But I came out here and Looking the other way. I thought about this. This is our old garden. Huge garden. Boy. Maybe not an acre. But probably over half an acre. We didn't have it all uh, in the garden, obviously. But um, lots to do out here. We're turning it into not a garden. We're turning it back into pasture so we can just mow it. It's been a lot of trouble and we're not going to garden anymore. Oh, I'm sorry about my hair. My hair's getting really long, which I like, but when I get it hard and start working, it's hot. So I braid it and put it up and it sticks out like a peacock. Anyway, that little structure right there is our hoop house. The, when we first came here, Adam built a small little hoop house kind of greenhouse thing for me to start plants in, tomato plants and stuff. And it was less than half that size. And I loved it and it worked well. So he built me this big one. Let me go show you this thing and, and show you what I, uh, I got distracted with when I came out. I brought a shovel to try to get some of the metal. We use the same old metal roofing material to line raised beds out here. So it's all embedded in the soil, lots of it. I know, so discouraging. This is why, I mean, this is a long project and we can't leave any of that metal in there if we're gonna mow. So, but this structure also is gonna have to be moved. I'm not really sure what it's going to become. Adam has an idea. I might have ideas, but we know we have to clean it out before we can move it. So I'll show it to you now. So here it is. It used to be such a glorious thing. and It is very large. Um, the window that used to go back there, um, the frame of it is leaning on the old post over there that used to be the gate to the garden with my jacket and sweater and scarf because I got really hot. Um, that over there is the door um, that went there, and I dragged it over there. Um, it's a decent, maybe, piece of plywood, but dried out some. It wasn't, it was lying on the ground inside. And this is uh, the thing that happened is that um, in spring of 2020, just when the pandemic was starting, my husband got diagnosed with a rare autoimmune illness, pemphigus vulgaris. It's a skin blistering illness, and I won't go into that, but it made him very ill. It took us a long time to get it diagnosed. The treatments are no fun. The illness itself is really appalling. Um, and not only is he battling that, but he is also now teaching school in addition to his pastoring job. So he's very busy and is exhausted all the time. And so I'm trying to do what I can out here. So <laughs> I haven't walked in here. All that to say, two years have gone by and nothing has been done, especially inside here. Actually, it would have been more like two and a half since I did anything in here. Um, we had some shelving along this edge that um, was made up of, pardon my, pardon my shadow, uh, part, made up of these um, metal shelves 
not really sure where they came from. They might have come from a restaurant that went defunct. And then they were held up with these PVC posts. Adam was very creative in coming up with ways to um, have things that worked well but were cheap. He, he built this structure himself. The whole thing. He bought it all and cut it out and hauled it over here. He used to be quite strong. Oh my goodness. Um, so I'm trying to get in here and clean everything out. I have taken out that this blue barrel used to used to keep it full of water so that I could water everything and this was its um la 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 little I guess that's how it came out the water came out I don't remember it had a spigot on it some it did have a spigot and it had a little float in it for a toilet um commode float I don't know what all that was about and it um if I've got any photographs that I can go dig up I'll put them on here um, and, and it used to sit here, and it was on a raised platform um, so that um, I could get to the spigot easily, and the gravity would feed it out. And so that the wood for that platform got thrown, of course, into the, the hoop house so that he could mow. And now I'm trying to get it out of there. Here's a good bit of it. This is just, I think, wide enough for him to get his riding mower through here. Well, our riding mower. I'm going to become the riding mower hero on this property, except for in the summer when it's outrageously hot. So anyway, there's a little bit of wood left in this end of it. You see that down there. But these, this has become a major tree down there. It's a huge thing. Uh, but I will conquer this, and I'll get it cleaned out. Um, he also, I mean, he built this really well. So he built it with I don't know what you call these, but it's got a, wow, that's wider than I thought. Okay, so at the base, all around the entire perimeter, maybe even the door, looks like a two by eight. This is just some bracing you put on. Boy, that's rot though, that's rotten. Mm. Very rotten. Um, and all this is bolted into the ground. But if it's all that rotten, it might be easier to get up than I think. And then you have this wonderful tubing, and on top of this sturdy metal tubing, which he bracketed in to the side rails, he also, oh, here's some. Here's this, these, this metal running stuff. Boy, I wish I knew what the word was. <laughs> anyway, we had wiggle wire. We have wiggle wire in there. You can still see that wiggle wire. We use this on the front porch and here, and then... He did that and put plastic. This plastic used to go back over this way. And the whole thing was encased in this heavy-duty plastic. But over two and a half years, eventually it did shred. The UV light got to it. So, this is the... I hate to say it's the sad end. It's the, it's the expected end of all things. It's not going to go on forever. This, is, um, this was a grand adventure that um, we enjoyed for about five years. And I think we're done with it now. Um, I know we're done with it now. Now where this, oh, how big is this thing? It's, it's quite large. Um, Adam wants to move it somewhere closer in the house lot. And he wants to put, he has a dead hot tub uh, that was given to him. He had it hauled to the farm. And he'd like to repair the hot tub, which will be expensive. And he'd like to put it inside this and turn this back into, you know, put the wiggle wire back on, fix it all up, get it enclosed, and have a private hot tub, <laughs> which would really, really make his terrible achy joints feel better. That's for sure. Uh, whether, but thing is moving this, I just don't know. And um, it would be hard to do if he was in good health. And there's no way he has the energy to do it now. So this is, again, long-term project, but I'm doing some of the preliminary work. Um, if I don't take all this stuff out of here, it'll never happen. So I'm going to get this as ready as I can for when we might be able to move it. And we could maybe use the riding mower to help pull parts of it if we could get it loose from the ground. Let's see. We will see. Oh, let me just real quick show you what I was talking about. This is, you see this metal? That piece got ripped up. But like this whole bed from here all the way past that post. It's a long rectangular bed. It's all encased in metal. But I don't 
know that it's buried too deep. Look at these, look at these weeds. That have, <laughs> it's outrageous. This is why we want to mow out here because the beds, you know it's bad when your garden beds are worse than the regular grass. <laughs> oh, you gotta laugh. All right. Um, so I thought I would show you what I'm, what I've been doing. Um, but everything, absolutely everything in here has to go except for maybe that rosemary bush right there. And I have some elderberries. I'm sure I've showed you those before. I've got a couple down there and some lavender. That's an asparagus bed, but we may just go ahead and say bye-bye to it. I don't know. I'm going to go in and have some lunch in a minute. All right. Well, I'm back in here. Back in the hoop house. Still look. If you wonder why I need to do this now, instead of a few months from now, it's because this would have been the snakiest place on the planet. I have no idea. Ah, snaky, snaky. And I'm terrified of snakes. Really, truly, I am. I'm better than I used to be. Um, but I did find, oh, let me show you what I found. I found the spigot. <laughs> Here's the spigot. Here's another little piece of piping that made all this work. Um, you know, I wonder if we can have a use for that again. Maybe not for watering um, plants, but if we ever did make this a hip camp, just having some water that people could, I don't know, if we cleaned that out really well, the tub, and cleaned everything up really well, and put, um, ran a hose to it, and kept it full of water for people to um, wash their hands with, that might be good. Also got all the wood out. I need to ask Adam if he wants to keep some of these... Um, I think they're supposed to be four by fours. They're never really four by fours. Those look like two and a half by two, and maybe they're two by twos. I don't know. Um, and let me show you this. I'm back in the avenue of nuttle. <laughs> um, I pulled out this piece and those ones up there and the one over there. These are all small. They're all narrow. They're really not. They're not really that. They're awkward. I wouldn't call them, they'd be heavy to lift, but I'm not lifting, I'm just pulling. And now, as you can see, that's all dirt over there. I have, this is like, this is like lifting up those little pickup sticks when you were a kid. You dump them out on the table and you have to pick them up one at a time. So, yeah, you don't want to pull this one first or you'd be pulling all day long. This one's next, then probably that one. Then I might be able to get that one. And then these ones will come up. And there's... More metal over there, and there's metal on the other side of that fence. But we don't want to think about that right now. Oh, I never said either. This structure back here, uh, I use that term guardedly. Um, it used to be a chicken coop for a short period of time for three birds. It was pathetic, and they were uncomfortable, and uh, they disappeared one day. It's very sad. It was, who was back here? Uh, Bernie, my very favorite rooster. He was named after Rooster Cogburn. If I have pictures, I'll put them up of Bernie. And then I had a barred rock, and I wasn't sure if it was Ethel or Lucy, because they look so much alike, and when one of them died, I didn't know who I had left. And the other one was Pumpkin. Yes, Pumpkin was the other one. And they all disappeared the same day. And I think that a predator got in here, because this metal used to be really high before it kind of collapsed over the years. It was really high, and I think that a predator got in here, climbed on top of the metal, got over that fence right there, and into that coop. Um, because there were very few feathers. Either that or they just left, which I wouldn't blame them. This used to be their coop in the barn, but it was full of snakes and overrun with mice and even some rats. And I was like, uh-uh. So closed that off, which they were grumpy about, and had Adam build them a new coop. But it was just not adequate. And then they left one way or t'other. Okay. Oh, I can't believe I'm showing you all this. This is really the most horrible looking thing. And then the last little delight... For today. Oh, look, there's Bobo sniffing out my work. Hello, Bobo. They like to come out here on days like this. They love to sit in the shade and wait for me to get done. Um, I was walking back over toward the garden, and look what I found. It was lying like this in the grass. I have no idea who it belonged to, how it got there, when it got there. I don't think it was there an hour ago. <laughs> I don't have any idea. Um, Oh, I've been hearing somebody pound. I thought maybe somebody was doing repair work. But look, I have a neighbor 
back here building a house. This is across the field. These are big farm fields. And there's a whole row of houses on a street that comes out to the main road down there. Um, but look, they're building a new house. That's always good news in any neighborhood. We have slow but steady development here. My favorite thing back here are those two silos. They're really beautiful, they're not used anymore. And then there's an old, old single story farm building, very small, back there on that back road. I've only seen it one time, I really haven't driven back there much. But um, that's a pretty cool place. Um, did some painting. I'm painting some little cards for a friend. Uh, I'm painting hummingbirds. So let me take you in there and I'll show you what I've done with that. Oh, it's nice to be back inside with cold hands. that can get warmed up. All right. Oh, here's my yarn. So you can see I've been working on this is my last ball of the blue. We're working on that. I have a friend who wanted me to paint five hummingbirds for her. Um, hummingbirds are a family favorite. Let me do them in the order that I painted them, though. I did, I mean, I don't paint these out of my head because I'm not that kind of an artist. But what I usually do is go on Google Images and sometimes I will start and I'll, like, these are hummingbirds, so I'll, I'll type in watercolor hummingbird. And, of course, my goal is not to copy anybody's hummingbird. It's more to see what type of of watercolor hummingbirds have been painted, what style, what techniques, and can I do it? Can I, I, so I try to find one that I feel like I can do all the skills in there. And so I'll change the positioning or the color or the, um, on all of these I use salt too, which is a little different, but um, hummingbirds uh, bodies and the feather, the feathering would be hard to do, um, especially with watercolor. So I use this for the texturing. So here's the first one. Um, and I really uh, like the wings. The wings should look like they're in motion, and that was very hard to accomplish, but I generally like the shape. This one's a little chubby in the tummy, but otherwise I think that one's pretty good. Then I did this one. Now, my friend asked that these just be on individual cards, not, uh, she didn't want them on a greeting card with an envelope and that she's going to do other things with them. But this one I felt like was a little bit north on the card, more than I wanted. And so I put some flowers down here. I really like that. It adds a lot to the painting. The coloration's a little different on this. The positioning's a little different. But uh, still, I use the salt. And uh, yeah, I like that pretty well. I like the purple down here and the purple up there. Uh, on both of those, I had red. You often do see hummingbirds with a little red on their chest or something. But then when I looked online, then, then I went and looked at photographs. And I was like, well, let's look at real hummingbirds. Um, and I realized that they come in all kinds of colors. This one, uh, there's a photograph of one with a beak very like that, uh, kind of a bright orangey pink red, uh, dark on the tip. And the coloration of the body was all just, there wasn't really actually any purple. It was all shades of blue. Um, anyway, that almost looks more like a dove except for the beak. So, and it was sitting on a branch, a, a little branch of wood. So yeah, that one that turned out pretty well. It's very simple, but I like the effect. And then the last one, this was a different positioning of the bird, this, this photograph, um, kind of looking at his belly. And uh, the wings on this, I think I came the closest to accomplishing the look that they're in motion, especially with this one up on top. So I have one more to go. She wanted a total of five, so I'll find another photograph that I like. And um, and work with that as a resource, kind of as an, it's more of a prompt. Actually, it really what it is, is it helps me just to get the positioning. At this point, I kind of know the proportions too. So it's really just an issue of position. Um, anyway, so there are my hummingbirds so far. I don't do a lot of uh, painting videos because it's nervous for me to have the, the video camera running while I'm painting. Um, Plus, I tend to take up my whole desk when I do it, and there's not really a spot for a tripod. 
So I don't really put a lot of my artwork, which is fine. It's not a big deal. But that's what's happening right now. 